Hello friends and teachers and musicians. This is the March 2022 edition of Ask Me Anything for my YouTube channel. I hope you're all doing well. If we haven't met before, my name is Jana Williamson and welcome to my home piano studio. I have three questions that were submitted for today's video. The first one, I love this question. And if you've watched my videos on pieces like the Debussy First Arabesque, you know that I will say things like, please don't make this your student's first experience with polyrhythms. So this question came in, what is the best way to prepare students for polyrhythms? And should we prepare them for polyrhythms before we encounter them in a piece? Well, yes, we should encounter, prepare them before we encounter them in a piece, of course. You've heard me say that before. So I think there's a few steps in this process just to give this kind of a brief overview. Number one, when you are starting your beginning piano students, make sure that you use a rhythm, sorry, use a method that prioritizes rhythm. I personally be believe that rhythm is the most important skill to teach first. And oftentimes when I'm introducing a new piece to a student at any particular level, I will start with the rhythm. So my beginning students are doing a lot of clapping, tapping, using rhythm instruments, moving around. Um, certainly people who are uh, trained in things like Dalcros will have a lot of really strong opinions about movement and music, but I think that is the absolute foundation. When we're beginning, we need to be doing a lot of rhythm work. Secondarily, and related to that, it's our job when we're teaching younger children and beginning piano students to develop a sense of pulse. And there are a lot of opinions on how to do that, but that's, that's part of this, that, that it's not just being able to execute rhythms on the piano, but to be able to feel the pulse of whatever meter or time signature you are in. Thirdly, students need to really understand how beats are subdivided. And so, you know, feeling the big beat, that pulse, and then being able to divide in different ways into two. So if the pulse is one, two, three, four, we have one and two and three, or into threes, one and a two and a three and a. And there are a lot of early intermediate pieces that do a good job of going back and forth between that eighth note or duple division and then triplet or triple division. You know, compound meter will have it in triple division, whatever. The one that I like to teach first and really ingrain this in my students is the Duncombe Sonatina that sounds like this. I really feel like that piece is just an etude in being able to just subdivide into twos and to threes and still keep the steady pulse. Uh, and then this is just a little bit different because it's not necessarily directly tied to rhythmic understanding, but before our students can do anything with polyrhythms, they need to be able to very easily do two different things in their two different hands. So backing up way beyond, way before this, um, you know, in a mid elementary level, your students are going to learn how to do different articulations in their two hands, playing things such as five finger patterns with one hand staccato, one hand legato, all those kinds of things. Because until you've really sorted out that coordination on the two sides of your body, you're certainly not going to be able to do any kind of polyrhythm. So those are ways that I would prepare for that far before my student is encountering a piece such as the first arabesque by WC. Okay, question number two. How do you motivate a student who doesn't seem to like piano lessons, but the parents make the student practice or make the student take lessons? So this is, of course, a really hard question to answer without knowing any of the particulars, and that's all I know about this question. I started thinking about the quadrant, um, if you had an X, Y axis of amount that the student practices and um, amount that the student seems to enjoy piano lessons. And so, of course, we all want students who practice a lot and enjoy their lessons a lot. We've all had students who enjoy their lessons a lot but don't practice as much as they could or should. And we've had students who, um, you know, don't seem to enjoy their lessons and don't practice very much. And those typically don't stay around for very long. So this is kind of the odd quadrant of a student who does practice, probably because their parent has set up a really good practice routine and established habits around practicing. Um, but the student does not appear to actually enjoy lessons. I want to 
identify quickly that word the student doesn't seem to like lessons. Because unless the student has actually verbally on multiple occasions said things like, I really don't like playing the piano, I don't like coming to lessons, unless that has happened, we are trying to read their minds based on body language and you know everything that they present in a lesson to know whether or not they enjoy lessons. And I do think that sometimes what students present to us is not actually what they're feeling or thinking on the inside, especially for students who are very introverted or just very quiet in their demeanor. It's so easy to read a student who is very verbally expressive, very dramatic personality, you know, one that you always know what he or she is thinking because they tell you everything. And sometimes with students who are very quiet, uh, it's just impossible to know. It's our job to try to read between the lines as much as we can and have good communication with the parents. Like, is Jane enjoying her piano lessons? You know, has she given you any indication on how she feels about things? Do you know if she likes the pieces that I'm giving to her? You know, if you're not getting any kind of clear indication on that from the student. So that's my first thing is we don't actually know unless they've told us. Um, and my second point would be, yes, try to have regular communication with the parent. If you feel like the parent really is forcing the student, you know, kind of check in, like, why, why is this a priority for you? Um, talk through with them what their goals are. You know, maybe have a three-way conversation, especially if it's a teenager with the student. Like, what can we, you know, find that will motivate you? What kind of pieces do you like? What parts of piano do you like? Those kinds of things. Next point I would say is lower your expectations. It's really helpful to remember, especially for those of us who are dedicated, passionate teachers, that our students will probably never love what we do as much as we love what we do. <laughs> and I think even back to myself as a teenage piano student, I loved piano. And I was not invested in my progress, I don't think, as my teacher was. So it's just helpful to reframe and think, it's okay if this is not as important to my student as it is to me and still try to find things that they can enjoy and engage with. And then my last um, two points would be, be a student of your student. This is a phrase that one of my local colleagues uses. And so just really watch what does that student regularly gravitate towards in their practice. If you give them a choice of things to play first in their lesson, what are they always going to? Do they like the fast pieces? Do they like the lyrical pieces? Do they like things that they recognize? Do they like things more in a popular style? You know, really kind of watch what they gravitate towards and um, try to then assign repertoire accordingly. And that's my last point. We really just have to give repertoire to our students that they enjoy. And it doesn't have to be all pop music. I don't mean that. So I'm gonna link a blog post that I wrote on this. I think there are really three main categories in repertoire that is usually appealing to students. Number one, fast pieces that are very virtuosic. Number two, lyrical or beautiful pieces that just really tug at your heartstrings. And number three, music that is recognizable. And that could be anything from pop music to recognizable classical tunes to um, something they know from church, something they know from a movie or a TV show, um, or something that their friend introduced them to. You know, it really could be anything. Last question today. How can we make practice more fun? I actually think this is related to the previous question. And I wanna just start off by saying, I don't actually think practice is fun. And I think we have to kind of like start off with it. Most students don't think practicing is fun. They might think playing the piano is fun. Um, some students might find a lot of therapy in playing the piano, which, you know, it's therapeutic to go sit and play and work out some of your feelings. I find practicing to be therapeutic in that way, um, but it might not be fun per se. So I don't think we should put on ourselves the burden that practice always needs to be fun, um, or else we will probably be fighting a losing battle. It's most important for young students to form a habit of practicing. And so we do want some things in their assignment to be enjoyable so that they think of practicing as something that's fun. And I think for beginning students, that's, that's pretty easy because a lot of beginning repertoire is very engaging. Um, as students grow older though, it becomes more and more like work. And so um, I, think, I think, again, motivating repertoire is the 
best thing you can do. And then if you use any kind of curriculum with accompanimental tracks or backing tracks or something that has a band, or if you can even use like a rhythm beat to go along with scales or other exercises like that, that can be one little tiny way of making something solo on the piano or whatever instrument you're teaching a little bit more enjoyable at home. I did print off, um, this is the mini essay number two from Piano Safari's free teacher resources. I know I recommend Piano Safari a lot. It's not just because I like the method. I do like the method. I mostly recommend them a lot because they have so much wonderful pedagogy on their website free for teachers to be able to access. And the authors, Julie Haig and Katherine Fisher, have just taken so much time to really think through um, pedagogical topics, and it's, it's a great resource. So this mini essay is titled, Should Piano Study Be Fun and Are Sticker Charts Bad? And um, it kind of talks about the ideas of extrinsic motivation and intrinsic motivation. And I would commend that to you. It's a great read. Julie Haig talks a lot about how it might not always be fun, but students should be deriving joy from their piano study and the difference in those two terms. So maybe thinking through that can help you a little bit. I hope this has given you a few little pieces of food for thought in regards to teaching music. If you have more questions that I can feature in my next Ask Me Anything video, please leave them in the comments. Please subscribe to my channel, hit the like button on this video, and I wish you all the best in your teaching.